Innovation and the ability to pivot are central to one Chicago-based tech company's work in fighting COVID-19. With the onset of the pandemic, Tempest, a remarkable genomics company in Chicago, shifted its focus from genetic testing of cancers and other diseases to coronavirus and used its tremendous power of machine learning and AI to help our country. Um, so with that, I'd love to bring on Eric Lipskowski for a discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Eric. Um, all right, sir. Whenever I talk to you, I'm kind of embarrassed. You know, my business, the healthcare business, our data are a mess. We're a lot of PDFs. We're not structured. We collect samples however we want. And you come from the tech world to our world. And I literally am embarrassed when we talk about data, about the state of where we are. How do you kind of approach what we do? I mean, how did you at able build Tempest literally from scratch and build structured data from a mess? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it is a mess. I mean, you know, and I think part of it is um, I equate it to uh, mowing lawns. You know, mowing lawns is not necessarily difficult. You just have to get out there and do the work. And I think in healthcare, one of the challenges is that cleaning up data, structuring data, harmonizing data is not exciting. It's not sexy. It's not, um, you know, it's not this thing that you really want to engage in. And so I think there's so many brilliant minds surrounding healthcare, but they have, for you know, lots of reasons chosen to just not kind of clean up their data house. And so when Tempest started, one of the first things we set out to do was just do that hard work to basically go through and structure that clinical data, harmonize the data, map the data, use informatics to make sense of the data. And what's amazing is just by cleaning up the data that's inside our electronic healthcare record system, you can produce, as, as you know, incredible insights. But it's, you know, it's, it is monotonous and it's hard and tedious and it requires both technology and people we now have something. So it's like not 15, fun, is what you're saying. There's no fun. fun. It's not fun. We have about 1,500 people at Tempest, and you know we add um, something like uh, 50 a month or something. And it's because it takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of technology to clean this data. And so, how did you pivot from doing this cancer genomics to COVID-19? How did that story happen? So what had happened to us was, you know, we were, we were in two disease areas. We were in cancer and we had just gotten into depression as our second disease area, doing pharmacogenomic profiling of people that have major depressive disorder. And we were actually thinking we'd go into cardiology next. Um, but when, when COVID showed up, we kept getting calls from people. You know, we work with something like 80% of all academic medical centers. And we were getting calls from people saying, Will you help us structure clinical data for COVID patients? Will you help us make sense? Will you help us build a data model for um, the therapeutics of these um, SARS-CoV-2 patients? Will you help us figure out how to do, for example, transcriptomic profiling of patients to figure out which RNA expression levels might be leading people to a particular response? And so it became apparent to us that this platform we had built to structure clinical data and append it to a laboratory test results in cancer and depression could be used to append that same insight to COVID tests. And so what you end up realizing is that a COVID test, positive or negative, is a really, it's binary, but it's a boring result. Am I positive and I'm gonna be asymptomatic? Am I positive and I'm gonna be on a ventilator? Am I positive and I'm gonna die? And so as a patient and as a physician, you really wanna be able to contextualize that result. So we, we pivoted, we literally said, let's just put all our energy around figuring out how to launch. This is our third disease area. And today I think we're at like um, roughly 12,000 tests a day and, and, and you know, uh, climbing. So we're, we're in it in a big way. You know, it's amazing for me to watch you because you know, we have these tech talks all the time and you're calling me about new ways of doing gene amplification and all kinds of things. And the passion and the depth of what you do is, it's something, you know, very, very unique. I mean, obviously you love it. Yeah, um, I mean, I say all the time, I wish I would have gone to medical school because I feel like I missed my uh, calling, but I, I love every part of it. I think as a, as a tech guy, I am amazed that technology has not permeated healthcare. And I'm convinced that all other areas of technology, 
and I mean all of it, the internet, mobile, social, e-commerce, uh, self-driving cars will all seem tiny and irrelevant next to what I think is really about to become this kind of molecular age where technology is going to permeate healthcare and we're going to keep people alive and keep them alive longer and healthier and eradicate diseases that have plagued us for centuries. And so I don't know, like if you're a technologist, what else, like this is where you want to be, I think. That's pretty cool. At least you give me excitement about what I do. I love that. So <laughs> get, getting into the COVID space, what have you learned? I mean, what are some lessons that we can talk about that can actually you know, show what we're doing right or wrong in the space here? I would tell you from a data perspective, the, the first, the thing that's really um, super troubling is even in the midst of a global pandemic, it is very hard to get people to truly break down these data silos and contribute data. I mean, you still have IRBs and data privacy committees and, you know, I'm writing a paper and it never ends. And it has been very hard, even in the midst of like this, to get people to say, um, take this data and if you can actually help in any way, it's yours. So I, I'm hopeful that we will solve that problem over time with technology because I don't think it's going to be solved with policy and I don't think it's going to be solved by behavioral changes. So that's been one of the biggest. The second is, you know, and you, you know this better than I do, we, we were holistically unprepared for this and are really holistically unprepared for the next one if it's worse. And so I think we'll get through this okay, but with obviously, you know, a lot of pain and a lot of loss of life. But um, this, this, this particular virus could mutate, other viruses could show up. And if we don't find a way to bring technology, bring the best of data science, the best of biology and chemistry together, we're, we're, we're going to be unprepared for the next one. Uh, those are uh, uh, certainly looming words that uh, scare me a little bit, but um, the testing itself, right? I mean, I understand the technology behind it, but what comes next? What are we doing with the data of a positive result, a negative result, what's going on in the country, pockets, the dynamics of the results? What can we learn from that? I think the first thing, we, the way to think, I, the way I think about it is you just have to first create a self-learning system. So for example, in a perfect world, you run a laboratory test, whatever that test is, a COVID test, a CAT scan, an MRI, a genomic test, a blood test, pick your test. But you want a system that takes that test result that, in, that basically drives a particular behavior of, for a physician. And you want to capture over time whether or not the, the particulars of that patient, their own phenotypic profile, their own therapeutic response measures up to that test result so that you make tests better and better and better and more personalized. And COVID is a great example. We, we want to make um, smart COVID tests. And I think the, the challenge with COVID it really is two problems from a testing perspective. One, the test itself is not smart, even though it's a, it's a perfectly good test, whether that's PCR-based or serology-based. More importantly, what happens during cold and flu season when I'm symptomatic, I have a fever, I have a cough, and I don't have COVID? What else do I have? And am I not being treated? And so you really want this, this kind of approach, um, pan viral, pan known respiratory pathogen, so you can ultimately guide people to the right therapeutic. And I think that's what Tempest is working on now is a kind of a 40 virus panel that is smart and learns and helps people figure out uh, how am I going to treat these symptoms I have when they're not COVID or when they are COVID? Listen, it's kind of cool, right? I mean, you obviously did it in cancer and you were crazy successful when everyone said you can't. Um, and then using that knowledge literally on a dime and you're developing the same thing for infectious disease is inspiring. So last question ended on what keeps you up at night? Besides your children, obviously, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried what? about? I'll tell you, I, at Tempest, I worry about two things. We've had so much success that I worry about reputational damage or security breach, in large part because Tempest is one of the leaders of bringing AI to healthcare. And, and, to, and to have that go badly, to have, to have us do something wrong or in some way, shape, or form have this negative perception, I think um, would be bad, not just for Tempest, but bad for bringing technology to healthcare. So I'm kind of hyper fixated on how do we make sure that we have a low profile, 
that we keep our heads down, that we try to stay you know, humble and, and don't have problems that have other people, high profile companies in our space have had, which have um, you know, been a big setback for everybody. Well, thank you, Eric. I thank you for spending the time. And I want to say at the end, I mean, I am proud of you and what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. And I, you, thank you.